Great to see you. Wonderful to be here at the Trans Tech Conference. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is my first time. Uh, greetings from uh, New York uh, State. <laughs> So um, I'm going to dive right in after that kind introduction. And I'm so energized by all the presentations that I've heard uh, over the last day and a half, uh, which present a, a wonderfully positive yet responsible approach to developing this new field of technology. Our culture is full of technology stories. Some are utopian stories about how technology may save us. Many are dystopian stories about all of the parade of horrors that can happen with unfettered technology. Um, obviously, as a culture, we think a lot about technology, and yet one of the things that it's really important to think about is the ways that technology, technologies, are not necessarily either good or bad, but are products of the cultures that produce and consume them, and therefore tend to feed into and magnify both the best and worst of the culture's existing structures, institutions, and biases. Every utopian or dystopian story about technology is really a utopian or dystopian story about our culture. Sometimes we also think of technology and scientific endeavors as being pure, apart from culture, in a way that we would never think of art as being apart from the culture that produces or consumes it. While natural facts may stand on their own, technologies are as much a cultural product as the arts are. So Rafa uh, and I, in our own spheres, have been thinking a lot about how neurotechnologies and brain-computer interfaces in particular are likely to enter our culture in ways that predictably may magnify uh, existing concerns that we have. One of the benefits of knowing that technologies are not neutral, that they magnify the social structures that they come into, is that it helps us predict some of the problems that we may have. Um, now, you may be saying to yourself, ah, but some technologies are disruptive. A disruptive technology changes culture. And I agree. At the same time, even the most disruptive technologies with potential for positive disruption, like the internet, we also increasingly are coming to understand that they can have a dark side that is the same dark side as the culture that is using it, not coincidentally. And that a little advanced architecture on the product side and on the legal and regulatory side can help us anticipate and ameliorate what those dark sides are and channel these developing technologies to their best possible uses. Uh, Rafa and I are going to talk about a few ways to do that at the highest levels, constitutional and um, design and at regulatory and um, investor levels. So with that, um, Rafa, I would love to hear more about the technocratic oath. Um, thank you, Amanda. So yeah, you can imagine that uh, we have a problem, which is you have these amazing technologies which are actually carrying humanity forward, uh, and they've always had. But uh, as Amanda is saying, they're neutral. They can be used for good and for bad. In fact, uh, I work at Columbia next to a building, which is a national monument. It's actually the Pupin Lab, uh, the physics department. And it's a national uh, registered place because in the basement, they built the first atomic reactor and that gave rise to the atomic bomb. And that was the Manhattan Project. That's why they called it Manhattan. But you probably don't know that the same physicists who built the atomic bomb in that building were the first ones to propose ethical and societal guidelines for atomic energy. So this is a classical example. We now have another uh, te uh, technology uh, in our hands, uh, neurotechnology, which is merging with AI. So this is going to be like a double whammy, you know, because you're going to have the algorithms, the power of AI connected directly to your brain through brain computer interfaces. This is unavoidable. 10 years from now, we're probably going to have this conversation with a wearable BCI. You know? So what can we do to ensure, to put guardrails, to ensure that this technology is propels us forward and doesn't actually come back to, come back to haunt us. And there is defensive measures, and uh, Amanda and I will talk about that uh, hopefully later, which is protection. So you can put regulations in place. Uh, we, I can talk about human rights, new human rights, and this sort of to defend uh, the citizens, citizens the, the human, from abuses. No? But, uh, uh, and these regulations tend to come from the top down. No? So you have the parliaments, or the governments or the, the companies themselves, the CEOs get together and they, they 
they decide this is what we're doing and they send this information down to the troops. And it's all good. And we're working uh, in this direction. But there's another way, which is a little bit more proactive. Now, instead of trying to defend ourselves, how about convincing the people who can actually uh, use this technology uh, for the wrong reasons or for for uh, uh, turn turn the, the the wrong corner? How how about if we convince them not to do it? So this is uh, instead of from the top down, how about from the bottom up? Okay, so that every practitioner, every engineer, every neurotechnologist, every uh, coder that writes AI algorithm has a, a personal kind of conduct. No? Um, and this is not the first time that this has been tried. This is what happens in medicine. So I'm actually a medical doctor, and we swear a Hippocratic oath before we graduate to use our knowledge to benefit uh, mankind. It's a humanistic profession. And this is a bottom-up personal commitment, a pledge that everyone makes so that you know if you go to a doctor, doesn't matter where in the world, doesn't matter where, when in history, there's always going to be a person there is going to be there to help you. Know? You trust the, the profession. And this is besides the top-down regulations that we get as doctors coming down through the IRBs, the hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. So how about importing this medical model to tech, to neurotechnology, to AI, to the tech industry? You know? So, uh, so our idea is what we call a technocratic oath, okay? Which will bring it will be a personal pledge, a very short pledge, just like in medicine. It will have four uh, pillars, four four uh, four sentences, one uh, four principles. One is the principle of beneficence. So do good. So use your knowledge and your technology to to help to do good. The second one is the principle of justice. Now, apply your knowledge fairly so that you don't help someone and you don't help the next person. This is actually, you can imagine in, in medicine if that were to happen. No? The third principle uh, is also coming straight from medicine is the principle of dignity. Treat the, 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 the clients, the person as a human being, not as a commodity or as a number in your screen. And the fourth uh, principle is the principle of transparency so that your work, your algorithms, your devices, it's transparent to the person that's using them, what is happening, uh, the, the good and the bad things. And also it's transparent to other members of your profession that may want to go there and help uh, later on, or maybe you may not be around. So this is the transparency principle. So this is the four pillars of the technocratic oath. We're, tr we're trying a pilot of that in two companies. I cannot uh, discuss yet, uh, which companies they are, but one of them is a major Silicon Valley company, and that one is a major computer uh, computer industry uh, company. Uh, and uh, we're going to have actually a, a meeting next week, uh, online meeting on brain computer interfaces to when everyone is invited. It's actually on the web at Columbia Neurotechnology Center, where we're going to be uh, announcing these pilot programs. But the idea is that this could actually be spread through the uh, the, the employees of tech companies, uh, the, the entrepreneurs, the CEOs, uh, the engineers, the, uh, the medical researchers like, uh, like myself, people building devices as well, so that we would all have an internal code of conduct. Uh, and maybe that could turn the needle a little bit uh, towards ethics and provide a deontology, like an ethical backbone to this profession as humanity is entering this exciting new era. Rafa, um, I love that the technocratic oath has the potential to generate norms in an area that is currently normatively heterogeneous or where norms have not yet had a chance fully to develop. And I think uh, at this moment in global political history, we're all having a lot of an opportunity to think about the relationship between norms, institutions, and rules and laws. We need them all. Institutions and regulations on their own cannot be operational without norms and people who are committed to behaving ethically and operationalizing those formal principles. Similarly, norms on their own may need more formal instantiation in the world to go out and do work. So I love the idea of the technocratic oath as the foundation, in a sense, a normative foundation for then the other superstructures that can build on top of that. Um, 
there is, uh, especially because even highly ethical practices uh, at one level can be taken and used amiss at another level. Yesterday, Gabe Aronovich from Health Rhythms, great work team, um, was talking about being a privacy first company and was talking about some of the values of dignity uh, and a medical model that, uh, that you're talking about. But then Poppy Crumb pointed out yesterday evening that there is no technology that can't be misused after it has been created. So how do you see the interplay between the technocratic oath and other more formal legal or regulatory interventions that might take place? Yeah, this is a great question. I think we need them both. I don't think we have the luxury of, <laughs> of going entering this uh, new world in which we're gonna be transformed mm -hmm. um, uh, without uh, like, a couple of, uh, of plans uh, in place. No? Mm -hmm. And they're very complementary. As I was saying, one of them is essentially top down and that has its its place and it, it has to exist. Now you have to have regulations that get tied down to the existing laws of the country and those get tied down all the way to the, to the basic Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that defines in an agreeable fashion across humanity, uh, across the world what it makes us human but besides that i think it's very important to have a bottom-up approach i think i'm actually a firm believer of the the power of uh, of the bottom up no i think uh, it's only so much that institutions can do at the end of the day mm -hmm. you're only as good as the people uh and uh if we can uh have every one of us adopt a personal pledge a personal commitment mm -hmm. like an oath that you will make it once and you will never forget it, okay? And if it's simple, like three, four, four principles, you will never forget it. Fast forward 20 years, you're in, a, you're in a difficult situation, you don't know what to do, there's an ethical problem, and they said, oh yeah, I know what to do. This mm -hmm. is this comes straight out of the pledge I took uh, uh, 20 years ago when I was younger. This is the same thing that has happened in medicine. In fact, you can think of medicine just as another technology, and you can use it for good and for bad. No? You could, I mean, the knowledge that the doctor mm -hmm. has, imagine if the doctor were interested in harming the patient. I mean, it would be no, it's, it wouldn't be a pretty picture. No? But guess what? It's been 2,000 years in which essentially without any any uh, uh, exception, I mean, maybe there's a, some cases with the Nazis, but it's essentially 2,000 years of impeccable track record. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're in the worst dictatorship, you go to the doctor and there's someone that will help you. Why can't we have the same recipe that's worked so well on another type of technology, which we're normally not used to think of this as, as medicine. But what I'm suggesting is that uh, we bring in the, the model, no? we bring in the, the medical model uh, and, and, and turn, turn uh, the tech, uh, AI and neurotech industry into a humanistic profession. Why not? I mean, if this is, why couldn't it be a humanistic profession? Something that you would be proud to go into because you know you're gonna be helping people, you're gonna be helping mankind. Hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think the principle of beneficence from medicine has strong applications in neurotechnology in particular. Um, I'll give an example of how I think something like the technocratic oath could be complementary with and supportive of additional layers of uh, ethical structure and legal regulation. So in my own work, I've had the good fortune to collaborate with many excellent pain neuroscientists. And pain might not seem like the most obvious area, but it's something everybody experiences. And it's a mixed subjective, objective, physical and emotional state that can be imaged in the brain. So it's, a, it's an excellent case study for many other kinds of subjective states. So uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging has made some great breakthroughs in tracking how pain, particularly chronic pain, uh, is generated and maintained centrally. Um, and yet, where do we see the interest in pain detection devices? It's not primarily to enhance patient well-being. Um, or even to facilitate drug development and put quantification around how successful is this drug target that we're developing to treat pain conditions. Instead, most of the requests for proposal that one can find are from the Social Security Disability Administration to engage in pain surveillance to root out fraud, or in some cases, proposals that hospitals should adopt pain scanners 
to determine whether individuals who come to the emergency room are engaged in drug seeking, uh, if they have legitimate pain or if they are seeking opioids. Both of these uses of potential pain surveillance technology are not what we would call beneficent. They are not for the benefit of the person who is alleging that they're suffering pain. Instead, they're fitting into some pre-existing social narratives about who's likely to engage in fraud, what kinds of disabilities are real, um, who is likely to be drug seeking or actually in pain when they come to the emergency department. And we know that those judgments are frequently heavily racially biased and, and biased by gender. So people who would be subjected to this heightened screening, there would probably be a disproportionate impact on uh, disadvantaged communities, even though the technologists who made the product could have done so with the best ethics. And so to deal with that next level where you have a well-intended, well-designed product that's then being taken up in society in ways that can reinforce biases and status inequalities, then I would suggest we need a next level of regulation that embodies anti-discrimination principles, not just privacy principles, and also that requires a certain level of accuracy before individuals can have consequential decisions made about their own lives, like whether they get certain kinds of medical treatment or whether they are entitled to disability benefits or veterans benefits, based on the application of a neurotechnology. Um, typically, our legal system falls back on consent and says, well, if the person consents to the test or the procedure or whatever it is, we use that as our, dare I say, get out of jail free card. But in areas where there are great asymmetries of knowledge and power, consent may be largely ineffective. And so I think there's a dual role for the ethics amongst developers and companies and, and investors, and Diana Savile is doing great work with this, uh, with the Brain Mind Initiative, but also a second layer that guarantees the beneficent and anti-discriminatory use of these technologies, as well as a threshold accuracy before they can be used for legally consequential decision making. Yeah, you know, Amanda, in this respect, uh, I completely agree with you. Um, Maybe I, I could talk a little bit about what's going on in Chile because this is actually quite interesting. Oh, interesting. So you would never um, have thought of this, but it turns out that Chile, the country of Chile, has uh, extreme sensitivity to any human rights issues because of their tragic uh, recent history. And as a consequence of that, they're top-notch human rights uh, lawyers, uh, judicial experts, legislators, and... Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, laws in place and administ administrative structure in place to deal with human rights abuses. No? And uh, they took a particular interest in this uh, potential human rights impact of uh, digital technologies, of technology, AI, and neurotechnology. And as a consequence of a dialogue uh, between a group of people that I represent, the Morningside uh, Group, which is a group of 25 experts, uh, neurotechnologists, neurosurgeons, bioethicists, lawyers, and representatives from the brain initiatives from all over the world. So we propose the idea of new human rights, and this is what we call neural rights, that would protect uh, essentially the human mind, the human brain, from future potential abuses caused by neurotechnology or AI. You know? Anyway, so the Chileans, the Chilean Senate of the Republic took that to heart and they've introduced a constitutional amendment, okay? <laughs> Article 19 of the Chilean constitution, there's an amendment in the been discussed to introduce uh, the protection for mental integrity as something that is actually at the core of the, of the values of the constitution. And on top of that, they put in a, a bill of law, which has been discussed now in the Senate, uh, that adopts neural rights and, gener and also applies the medical model to these type of problems. So Chile uh, is a pioneer case uh, because of these particularities of that country. And this is an example of uh, of a path that could be followed by the US and other countries. You now essentially bringing in a new set of regulation that are anchored on human rights, which define essentially uh, what type of society, what type of humanity we want to be. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating. And I think Chile will wind up having been a, a leader for the world. 
Um, in the US, we have something of a precedent with uh, genetic information. We have the statute GINA from 2008, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination and Non-Disclosure Act uh, that says that employers uh, cannot require genetic testing or ask a person to undergo genetic testing and protects people from genetic discrimination. But our neurological data reveals so much more about us and uh, has potentially so many more applications that um, it really it's time for the US to start looking into uh, uh, something like a NINA, a Neuroscience uh, Information Non-Disclosure or a Non-Discrimination Act, and also potentially uh, a constitutional level amendment where of course constitutional amendments would, would bind what the government can do, not so much private actors, and then the statutory framework would cover all of those other important domains of our lives from employment to education to uh, the rest of the private sector and consumer tech. It's, uh, in fact, I completely agree. This is a perfect time now with a new administration to tackle this uh, problem head on. It's not too late. Uh, um, uh, this, uh, this is actually uh, uh, this change. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's actually an exciting time. Uh, if we had more time, I could uh, talk to you, uh, to you guys about um, uh, how the brain got started and how all these ethical regulations were uh, essentially uh, uh, generated during the Obama administration or what happened in the last four years. But this will be a topic of another conversation. <laughs> yes, but anyway, I think I think we do have a duty actually, as uh, mm -hmm. both as citizens, as, as uh, particular as experts, uh, you Amanda and me in my field to alert people of the importance of these issues, the uh, ethical regulation of neurotechnology and AI. Uh, this is a fundamental problem. Uh, I, I view this as a tsunami that is going to hit us just like mm -hmm. COVID did. Yeah. <laughs> Except this one is more like in five years. I can see it coming yeah. okay? and it's getting closer and closer. But uh, we should be smart as a society and, and uh, have all the guide rails in place uh, so that uh, we don't get uh, washed away. <laughs> Yes, and collaboration is tremendously important from uh, across research communities, private sector, and government, because without collaboration, there will be activity that misses the point. And while we can't anticipate everything, if we don't work together, we can't anticipate anything. So all of you who are technologists, researchers, investors, you might not usually think of yourselves as participating in the political process, but your voices need to be heard, and you are part of doing this essential work of developing the norms that Rafa is talking about as well. Wonderful. So um, so I think we're just about out of time, uh, and we, uh, Jeffrey. <laughs> you are. We, you can have a couple more minutes. If you've got some last thoughts to toss in, that's certainly fine. Um, well, um, yeah, actually, the. Uh, we will have a Q&A, so this is something also, it's unfortunate we cannot be interacting live right now with every one of you who's, who's listening, but uh, if you're interested in these topics, please uh, stay for the Q&A and pepper us with any questions. Um, I also would encourage you, if you want to follow up with uh, the group uh, of people that I represent uh, that is interested in uh, a newer rights, uh, we're, we're essentially uh, advocating for new human rights. Uh, so we have a neural rights initiative that you can find in, in the web that is based at Columbia, but we're actually part of a network uh, that's worldwide. Uh, and there's some information about what's going on in Chile um, uh, there, which is very exciting. Uh, and uh, I should also tell you that uh, we've been also uh, requested to write some position papers, white papers for the landing team of the Biden administration. So hopefully they will uh, take on this, uh, this important issue. And then in terms of the technocratic oath, I think uh, those of you who work in the tech industry, I would encourage you to, to think about that. Uh, how about taking a personal pledge of, uh, and um, what, wouldn't that be wonderful so that you can actually see yourself uh, a little bit with the same, uh, uh, have the same feeling that doctors have and say, you know what, I'm doing something that's good for mankind. No? And, uh, it's a wonderful uh, thing I'm doing with my life. No? And, uh, and the idea is, is again, just to, to have this spread through the, 
in a grassroots fashion, bottom up, um, without any, it, it doesn't have any legal uh, consequences, just a personal pledge. It's like your, your, like, like your beliefs, no? And, uh, but that, that could help uh, turn a little bit the, uh, as I was saying, the needle uh, towers ethics in, uh, in these critical issues.